Hello and welcome to that shooting show. My name's Steve Anderson. I am your humble host. I am weary. I am worn. My shoes are soggy and I am sunburned. After about 20 days nonstop being on the range leading up to Carry Optics Nationals, another three days on the range, well actually four, open to close, sun up to sundown, Carry Optics Nationals, I have so much to report about this match and what you can learn from it. First, I want to thank Walther. I got to meet most of the Walther team. I uh, got to meet Chris Long. Uh, I kind of met Juan Sit Kim coming out of the porta potty. <laughs> I don't know if that counts as meeting Juan Sit Kim or not, but there was a, a brief moment there in the ingress, egress of the porta potty where I kind of met Juan Sit Kim. <laughs> got to see Gabby, of course, spent the day with Jay. Uh, being around all those Walther folks and on the Walther promo video uh, you can find that on the Instagram they got me doing my best Gene Simmons uh, I got the uh, got the rock and roll horns got the tongue uh, YouTubers can see it looks kind of like this yeah very very rock and roll I'm kind of surprised they used that one but hey that's what Walther wants that's what Walther gets <laughs> And I may have sold a Walther PDP. Um, I ran into an old friend. Of, well, I say old, uh, I guess, long-term friend of mine, a young man named Joey that I had worked with probably 10 years ago in one of the first private lessons I ever did. Uh, got to see him. He used to have an Ace Ventura haircut. He, he, like, he went from like a miniature Ace Ventura to Jack Reacher. Uh, the real Jack Reacher, not the Tom Cruise Jack Reacher, in about 10 years, and he was having trouble with the gun he brought to Carry Optics Nationals. A lot of folks came to Carry Optics Nationals with new guns. Like, everybody in the world grabbed the dot gun and came to Ohio. You know, more on that in a minute. But he was complaining about some malfunctions, and I he, he, he did kind of get it fair enough. I said, hey, I got a Walther in the truck. It's 100% reliable. He goes, let's go shoot it. So I went down to the to the side end bay, and he experienced two magazines of trouble-free Walther PDP performance. And I reminded him, hey, hey, you buy one of these things, you get yourself a PDP. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. You'll be satisfied 100p, or you will pay no fee. And uh, I think he's probably going to get one. And, of course, mine ride with Vortex Optics, because Vortex is my favorite my very favorite optics company. Um, so yeah, Walther is the title sponsor of the podcast. And uh, it was wonderful, wonderful to meet Chris Long and hang out with him a little bit. I also want to thank Targets USA, manufacturers of the finest steel targetry on the planet. We did uh, a bunch of days of warm-up uh, for a few shooters who were coming to Ohio. My range is in Newark, Ohio. It is 45 minutes from the Cardinal Shooting Center. So you folks shooting limited nat uh, nationals, I don't know exactly when that is. I'll go look that up. But if you want to do sort of a match mode tune-up on my range, prior to nationals we can absolutely make that happen um, i'll check those dates as soon as we get done with today's program and uh, i'll make that more available tomorrow on tomorrow's podcast uh, and of course cr speed manufacturing the finest gun handling gadgetry on the planet i saw a fair number of cr speed mag pouches on the super squad uh jbl obviously um, I can't remember. I, I just, I'm, my point is I, I saw more CR speed mad pouches than maybe I was expecting to see. So that was pretty cool. Uh, the AMG dash lab.com Clanderson timer was out in full effect. Uh, I can't say with hundred percent certainty, but most of the timers that I saw on the range were AMG dash lab.com Clanderson timers. If you have an order number and you want to email it to me, I can send that in to get it to try to get expedited, but please Take it easy on me, guys. I don't work for AMG. I don't have anything to do with the production schedule. Some of the hate mail is getting nasty, right? So please save your vitriol for somebody else. I will try to get it expedited, but you don't need to yell at me. It's not my fault, right? It is a great timer. I know there's a back order, and I'm sorry about that. There's literally nothing I can do but send your order in and try to get it expedited. And, of course, Hunter's HD Gold is the only eyewear that I wear, and I had an absolute hoot. Hanging out with Brian Conley. Uh, we did a couple of live broadcasts. We were going to do a few more, but Brian does this weird thing where he'd rather sell glasses than do live commentary. It's the strangest thing. 
Um, but we did get to do a couple things with there. Um, probably do more of that in the future. Uh, but thanks to Brian for his constant support and being one of the nicest guys on the range. And, of course, shoot sportsinnovations.com. It's a lot to type because there's a lot to see. And outdoordynamics.net saved at least one match. Uh, we had a couple of shooters that had some ammo problems. Never fear. I stepped in with the outdoordynamics.net ammunition and was able to uh, give at least one competitor certify, uh, certified. <laughs> certified non-power factor ammo and it is my pleasure to be able to help you out with that whenever i can uh we will be adding a couple of new classes to the website today and when i say i've been on the range non-stop for 20 days i'm, I'm not exaggerating um on the road at my home range captics nationals uh i apologize for the little bit of the email backup i've got going on i'll get to those as, just as soon as i can uh later on today um, we do have mental management running 5 p.m. today, tomorrow, and Wednesday. There's still time to get on that. If you're, uh, I guess, if you if you hear this and you're available at 5 p.m. Eastern today, tomorrow, and the following day, uh, you can still get in on that. We will have more management, more mental management opportunities available here coming up very shortly. And you can always go to upcoming classes to see where we're going to be and what we're going to be doing. And if you want to come to Newark, Ohio, and get all to well i suppose it's it's really a four-day class in one day um pretty much every drill we do in both classes is available to you here in newark ohio uh now that you know where cardinal shooting center is we're in newark ohio which is about 45 minutes i guess it would be southeast perhaps for sure south maybe east a little bit south a little bit east of uh the cardinal shooting center so now that you know where that is you pretty much know where we are and we have a beautiful 25-yard uh, by 25-yard range. And I have lots of ideas for how you can be ready for your next match based on what we saw at this at this uh, Carabix Nationals. Um, I think that's everything right now. Yeah, so let's go ahead and get into it. So 2023 Carabix Nationals Recap Part 1. I have uh, every stage from every super squatter on my phone i dutifully recorded every shoot on every stage with just a couple of exceptions um so we're going to do a bunch of things with those videos we'll be digging into those uh just as soon as i find time to go through them but i do have some takeaways from watching everything that i observed and here's what they are number one stage plans were varied and largely inconsequential and it was very interesting. As soon as we got there, we noticed that the stages were wildly different than the matchbook with a couple of exceptions. Um, they looked very, just like Jay Beal said, right? They, he said they're not going to be anything the same. He didn't even bother looking at the matchbook, and he did not make a mistake in that, in that deal. Uh, there were a couple of stages that were pretty similar. The only one that was identical was the standard stage, which Jay Beal won, by the way. Can I just remind you that Jay Beal won the standard stage? Drills 11 and 12 from refinement repetition. Jay Beal won it. He's done that 100,000 times at least. It was fascinating, though, to watch. Uh, I got to watch a lot of squads shoot that stage, and it was it was obvious who's been practicing stronghand weekend and who hasn't. We'll come back to that here in a minute. Um, the, the probably the most interesting and hotly debated stage was stage twenty. So, if you look in your matchbook, that's the one that has the 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 three shooting areas. And the interesting thing to me was as I talked to people. Uh, during staff day and the first day, um, th it was very interesting. Everybody said, oh, there's no way going to the front box is going to be worth a dang. Nobody with any brains is going to go to that front box. You don't need to do it. And day three, the day the Super Squad shot that stage, I overheard the mighty J.J. Rakaza saying, you know, I walked it both ways. I think I'm going front. And everybody who knew absolutely knew that going to that front box was a complete waste of time. The super squad found out that the times were within seconds. Well, actually, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I do remember it was less than a second difference between well-executed using all three boxes and well-executed executed just using two. So that tells me that the people who ever came up with these stages either knew 
or was intentional or designed them in such a way that execution was going to be far more important than plan. Um, as I got to watch the Super Squad, stage one, there was really only one way you could shoot it with a little bit of variation in that in that middle spot. Um, but outside of stage one, then of course the standard stages and the barrel stage and some of the other ones, I don't know that I saw the same plan twice. And, well, let's see. Make sure. Yeah, the Super Squad had different plans with a couple of exceptions where everybody kind of did the same thing. The other thing that was really interesting was that moving, as I predicted, was risky and rewarding if you could make the shots. I was a little surprised with how much the Super Squad decided to post up and shoot as opposed to staying moving a little bit. And I didn't get to see Christian Seiler shoot, nor have I seen any of his videos, but I would suspect that he stayed moving a little bit where the people on the super squad that I was with chose not to. That would be my suspicion. Again, that's strictly suspicion. I haven't gotten into all those numbers, and I, I didn't get to watch him shoot at all, and I haven't seen any of his videos, but I would guess he went one for one on steel more often, and I would guess that he stayed moving a little bit more than the other folks. That would just be my assumption based on what we know about his shooting. But number two, execution was far more important than the plan. Let me say that again. Execution was far more important than the plan. Steel makeups on the Super Squad typically accounted for a second or two added to times. Uh, the number of uncalled makeups, dirt makeups that I saw kind of surprised me a little bit. Um, I, saw, I, I saw some great called makeups, don't, don't get me wrong. But there were several instances where misses on steel were not called and were costly, very, very costly. And the hardcover movers were also very costly. On a stage with steel and movers, the biggest differential between the Super Squad times was steel in the first shot and timing of the movers. Those were the biggest differentiators that I saw in terms of time, right? Guy has called makeups on steel, has to wait for two or three passes of a hardcover swinger. That's four seconds, gang. But nailing the steel the first time, timing the mover right, getting two shots on one pass or one shot on two passes without hunting and pecking, those were the differences most of the time. And disrespected targets were disrespectful in return. If You guys that shot the match, if you remember that, that I don't remember the stage number right offhand, but there's that little window with those two 45-degree angle boys right on the bottom. Well, I saw somebody miss one of those, took a miss right into the hardcover. Right, suspect maybe we're aiming at the A zone instead of giving ourselves a little bit more room, but disrespecting it for sure. And the most interesting thing I heard was one very high level super squatter was telling me at the end of day one that shooting 15 yard targets with a clear optics gun is hard work. He says, "Man, it's it's hard work shooting alphas at 15 yards with a clear optics gun." I found that very very interesting. There were a lot of so called critical steel shots meaning first shot into position or last shot out of position was very frequently steel. Uh, stage one could be shot in such a way that that little window was the, was the steel was the only shot. That was one option, right? So people that are able to shoot steel, exiting and entering, and hit it every single time, had an advantage over people that were hunting and pecking. You know, speaking of stage one, uh, this was on the Super Squad, but I watched a shooter. Uh, you guys that were there remember, and you can look on the you can look in the matchbook. You started seated, loaded gun on the table. You ran into the shooting area. There's a paper and a steel. I watched one guy take four shots at that first steel target because he was in such. A, it wasn't a Super Squad, by the way, just a random squad. He was in such a hurry to get that transition done that he literally missed that thing four times. And I have so many great ideas for drills to put in future classes. The advanced class is getting ready to be how to win 2023 Captix Nationals because I know exactly how to do it. <laughs> I know exactly, exactly how to do it. And speaking of comparing the stages to the actual matchbook, it was very interesting to me how the the uh, four shots, four shots, reload, four shots, four shots was supposed to be hardcover at a sort of a close-ish distance. It was hard to tell from the matchbook. That's why we don't get too married to the matchbook. You can date the matchbook and you can fool around a little bit, but don't commit and don't get married because it's going to change. A Ooh, that's a very interesting marriage pun, right? Like It's like the marriage is more difficult than the dating. 
It's more difficult and potentially less fun with a lot more one hand. Never mind. So, so it was interesting how that particular one started out with hardcover, relatively close-ish, close-ish, and turned into a no-shoot, which is largely inconsequential. I, I don't know that I saw a single person hit the no-shoot. Uh, the mics were far more common than popping the no-shoot. Um, and if somebody in the Super Squad hit the no-shoot, I, 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 I didn't see it. Um, but how many people were expecting the, the strong hand only shooting to be at 25 yards? How many people were expecting any of the shooting to be at 25 yards? Right? So that, you know, somebody who's got a seven yard zero, that bullet is going to climb at 25 yards. I'm not sure how much depending on your, your bore and your dot offset and all the rest of it. But you know, 25 and if you, if you chose to stay only in the back box on stage 20, well, geez, that's, I didn't walk it, but some of those shots got into the 30 yard plus or minus territory, right? Is that something you can do? Were you expecting 30 yard shots at nationals? Were you expecting many poppers at 20, maybe farther yards, right? These are things we need to plan for. These are things we need to prepare for, right? Hit factors were mostly low with long periods of non shooting. Um, this, this particular match was a little bit more of a foot race than other matches I've been to. See, I told you. I told you foot speed's critical. Well, in this at this particular match, foot speed was more critical than your average match. Um, lots of periods of non-shooting, which of course drives the hit factor down, which of course makes points more important. Um, relative to oh, sorry about that. Sorry about the mic noise, my hat bonked the mic. Um relative to smaller stages with less periods of non-shooting guys stage plan is all about minimizing the time spent not shooting and you can do that however you want it well i suppose you can do it however you want but minimizing the time spent not shooting is the key to stage planning that's all you ever need to do minimize the time spent not shooting and uh splits is the last place to go looking for it i don't think i heard a split under 30 the entire first day um, day three, there was a little bit more of that, uh, day two, a little bit more of that. But on day one, I was astonished by how slow the splits were. I mean, these guys were not shooting quickly. Very, very interesting. Lots of retreating movement, lots of backward movement at this match. Is this something you practice? Is this something you can do with confidence? Do you know how to reload while you're retreating? All right. These are things that you need to know. And the mental game was very interesting. Um, I don't want to get into a lot of the details of the things I observed in in the mental game, but just out of respect for people's privacy, don't I don't like to use people's names that much without their permission. But you know, talking about strategy and what you're thinking about, right? I heard people talking about things they didn't want to happen, and those things frequently happened. Anytime you tell yourself not to do something or you think about something that you're worried about, you're creating a picture of your in your mind of what that looks like and what's going to happen if you do that. Far, far better to take the outcome that you want and give yourself something to do to make that outcome more likely as opposed to something not to do, right? And one of my favorite moments was uh, one of the guys on the squad was getting ready to go do something, and he said, I hope I don't <clears throat> this up. Uh, okay. Um, he's, he And Nils overheard it. He heard the guy say, I hope I don't screw this up. And Nils said, be careful. I'll send you over to talk to Steve. And that was one of my greatest moments. Anytime you're worried about screwing something up, you're going to picture screwing something up. And that is far more likely to happen because you're picturing the thing that you don't want to have happen. Okay. So that goes into strategy. Now, skill is not really a problem out there, right? There wasn't outside of the strong hand shooting at 25 yards. There wasn't an impossible shot out there. You know, some of them got stretched out pretty far on stage 20. If you stayed back, there were a couple of other further, you know, longer shots. Stage 21 had an opportunity to take some long shots and skip a period up front. Um, but going back to, uh, stage 20, the, the box with the, with the three, uh, sorry, the stage with the three boxes, I asked one super squatter, I said, Hey, how did you make that decision? He said, well, I generally do better shooting faster, close up than I do snarp, uh, sniping from far back. And once I knew the times were similar, the choice was easy to make. 
And that kind of goes back to one thing we think we know about stage planning is always rush the port. And that means that when, when you get a little closer and you make the shooting a little easier, it gets a little quicker. And JJ actually jogged that and timed it. He actually ran it. He said, you know what? I know I can cover this amount of ground in less than three seconds. And he figures that covering that ground in three seconds and doing closer, quicker shooting works out better. Well, that's great. He gets to make that decision. It worked out well for him. Okay? Uh, so that goes back to strategy. And skill, again, not a problem when guys got it right. And self-image. So let's talk about self-image. for, for So self-image does a few things. Number one, it is the source of your confidence or lack thereof. Okay, there were a couple of times where shooters found themselves doing better or worse than expected, and self-image issued a correction. Um, the the big gossip on day one was that Christian Seiler had kind of a rough day. Well, as soon as I heard that, I knew, well, that's not going to be a problem because Christian Seiler has one of the winningest self-images that I am aware of. And that means he expects to win this match. And if he has a rough day, that doesn't change his expectation. And I did hear from a second or third party that he said, I love the pressure, bring it on. Well, let's talk about pressure. Pressure is stress caused by the perceived importance of the event. In this case, it's the actual importance, but it's still perceived, so it's the same thing. And pressure will only ever amplify whatever you are thinking or feeling. So if you're feeling imposter syndrome because you're doing better than you thought you were going to, if you're feeling out of your comfort zone because you're doing worse than you expected, self-image will always issue a correction in accordance with your expectations, your performance. Now, how do we do that over time? Well, that's a topic that's going to take longer than we have today. But what I noticed is the shooters that were confident in their ability to do what they needed to do were able to do it. The shooters that were not confident in their ability to do what they needed to do were not able to do it. And it's really as simple as that, guys. I didn't see any lucky runs. I saw guys trying stuff and struggling, and I saw guys doing stuff that they knew that they could do and being very, very successful. And I thought that was very interesting. And the weather. So you guys got treated to three out of the four Ohio seasons. You got to experience spring, summer, and fall. The only thing you didn't get to experience was winter. And uh, maybe maybe they'll get to experience that at the uh, uh, Ironside Nationals. Uh, but we did have a lot of rain. Uh, it was pretty rainy on day one. Uh, day two and three, not so much. Uh, poor nil. Uh, maybe, maybe a little bit of rain on day two. Day, day three, there wasn't much rain. D- day one and two kind of blend together a little bit for me. It was it was long days on the range. I know day one was was the rainiest. Um, but I remember poor Nils had to shoot uh, one of his stages in a complete downpour. And I never heard a single person on the super squad complain about the rain. If they did, I didn't hear it. And I for sure didn't hear Nils complain. He went up to the line. He shot the downpour. Never a single complaint. Now, and also the gravel is pretty loose. Um, I remember I, I did a, I did a full speed walk through a couple of times just to kind of look at some stuff. Uh, that gravel was very, very loose. Now, the interesting thing was the getting it wet made it a little bit more tractiony, tractional, tractiony, made it a little less sloppy. Um, so in that case, the gravel getting wet seemed to pack it in a little bit and seemed to give a little bit more traction. So that was kind of cool. Um, there were some interesting challenges. Uh, poor JJ had a squib on one of the big stages and zeroed a very large stage. Uh, don't, don't really know. I overheard him a little bit talking about the ammo. It, 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 it had been tested, but I can tell you this. When I used to go to nationals, I used to weigh every single round to prevent a squib every single round. And obviously that was open for the most part. So the differential was easier to spot. But if I was going to nationals and I had 500 rounds, I would weigh every single round. And if it was outside of the acceptable range, you know, you're only using three, maybe four grains of powder, depending on what your powder is, but that should be perceptible on a scale. And if it's iffy, chuck it, right? Establish, Hey, this, this is the margin that I think a loaded round should weigh. If it's, if it's plus or minus this number, it goes in the practice box. Piece of cake that would have prevented that. Um, as we mentioned earlier, Christian Seiler had, had a couple of rough stages on day one. Uh, the rankings were well known. Um, everybody knew exactly where they were. 
and that was very, very interesting. It's also worth pointing out that Nils came in second place with absolutely zero stage wins. I took a brief look this morning just to do a little research. Um, he had a lot of second; he had a handful of second place finishes, but there were no outright stage wins for Nils to come in second place overall. And the discussion that I heard was mostly positive, and mostly having to do with points. And what I thought was very interesting is the shooters that were more likely to struggle were the ones that were more likely to complain. So the shooters that were more likely to complain were the shooters that were more likely to struggle. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, mostly positive. Uh, there was no trash talk that I overheard on the squad. Everybody was, was pretty supportive, pretty friendly, discussing chain, uh, stage plans, sharing stage plans. Uh, didn't, didn't see any psychological warfare, nor was I expecting to. Now let's talk about pressure. If you went to this match and you were feeling pressure, one of two things happened. Pressure either made you scared because you were worried about the results or pressure made you excited to shoot because you knew it was going to go well or you weren't worried about the results. And those are about the same thing, right? Probably more likely to be, I know I'm going to do well as opposed to not worried about the results. Again, those are pretty similar. One is a little bit more healthier self-image than the other. It's, it's, I suppose the difference is knowing it's going to go well can't be manufactured short-term quite as well as I'm not worried about the results, right? A very healthy way to go to nationals, if, if, it's, if it's your only big match, or particularly if it's your first nationals, is it is what it is. I'm just going to go see how I do. And if I don't have a winning performance, if I don't shoot like me, then I won't know how good I am. That's how I always went, right? Outside of my first nationals where I, I really wanted to be in the top 16, which caused me to undertry, by the way. I wanted a clean match, so I undertried, and I almost got a clean match. I think I came in just out of the top 16 that year, 21 maybe. I don't remember exactly. But after that, I never had an expectation of a finish. I said, hey, it is what it is, right? I'm just going to go to nationals once a year. See how good I am. That's that's a much healthier way to go. Um, two instances where there was where there was pressure. Uh, there was a shooter who found out he was doing far better than expected. Uh, pressure did some interesting things to that shooter, and then there was another shooter that had a very disappointing stage after a whole lot of pressure. Uh, we're not going to get into the, to the specifics of that, but pressure always reveals what you're thinking and feeling. So if we have a lack of confidence in any way, pressure is going to cause us to crack. But if we know what to do and we know we're going to be successful, we believe we can do it, pressure makes us better. And on the subject of consistency, um, I, haven't, I haven't gone through all the data. Um, I got back from the range last night at 8 o'clock, went almost immediately to bed, back up this morning to do mental management. And the two most consistent shooters – uh, that I'm aware of were Nils and, of course, the mighty Jay Beal. Very, very consistent shooting from both of those two guys and good finishes. And, of course, I want to congratulate Jay Beal on his, on his uh, top 10, 10th place finish. Uh, very, very consistent, just plugging alphas and plugging alphas with a very, very, very positive attitude. Um, so let's just go back over these real quick. Number one, the stages were very different from the matchbook. Anybody that created a hardcore plan from the matchbook probably had to scrap it. They're just obviously there were some exceptions on the small stages. But for the most part, if you created and burned in a plan based on the matchbook, you probably were wasting your time. Uh, there were places to stay moving, people that could make the shots. Uh, but the low the low hit factors made the points important. So it doesn't just mean it, it doesn't only mean you can make the shots, but it means you can shoot the alphas. Um, and that's probably why the super squad decided to post up most of the time instead of moving. But execution was far more important than strategy. And again, stage 20 with the three boxes, everybody knew that using the front box was dumb until the super squad got there and about half of them used the front box. And the times were very, very, very similar. So don't just discount some, wow, if I can skip that first position. Yeah, you could. And that wasn't a terrible plan. But I, neither was using the front box. And that goes back to your strengths. JJ is obviously very quick. He knows he's fast. He knows he's in good shape. So he's going to use the front box. Uh, the other shooter I spoke to would rather get up front and shoot quick. 
That's great. Plays to his strengths. Okay. Hit factors were relatively low with long periods of non-shooting. Um, that means alphas are a little bit more important um, than when the hit factor is higher, obviously. Lots of backwards movement. There were a lot of DQs on backwards movement. Uh, nobody on the Super Squad got DQ'd, uh, but I did hear about a lot of DQs on Stage 1 with the, uh, with the retreating movement. And I'm sure there were DQs on the other retreating movement, but I didn't, I didn't get into that with anybody. Um, Mental game was fascinating to observe. The weather was interesting, to say the least. If you come to a match in Ohio, be prepared for three out of the four seasons. And if you come in the fall, if you come September through the end of the year, be prepared for all four because that's just what Ohio is going to give you. Um, I thought J.J.'s attitude regarding the squib, I, I just want to publicly commend J.J. Um, it's difficult to imagine a competitor at his level having a squib at nationals. But his attitude was outstanding. Um, he stayed positive throughout the whole thing, didn't throw a fit, just soldiered on. So I really want to congratulate JJ for really handling that well. Um, and that's about it uh, for recap part one. Um, as soon as I have a chance, I'm going to go through some more of the data and give you some more information. Um, I'll be doing something with these videos. I haven't exactly decided what. Um, but the, the coolest thing about this match for me was, uh, we'll be able to incorporate a lot of the things I saw into upcoming classes so that you will never be unprepared for these challenges again. And I just want to remind people the execution of stage plan was far more important than the actual plan. And most of the time suck that I, that I saw, not just on the super squad, but everywhere had to do with miss and steal multiple passes on the activators that's really the that's most of what I saw. Obviously, mics are never good. There were a handful of mics, but let's just set those aside for a minute. But hitting the steel and doing well on, on the movers was pretty much the keys to success. So if you want to do well at Nationals yet next year, we need to be working on hardcover movers and steel under any conditions. I told you guys, 53 pieces of steel is 53 seconds plus or minus. And if, if I were you, I'd be out there practicing 25-yard mini poppers under any any movement condition, entering, exiting, um, all kinds of stuff like that. All right, folks, hope you've enjoyed today's program. This is 20, 2023 Care Optics Nationals Recap Part 1. There will be more coming, hopefully as soon as tomorrow. And until then, until we meet again, be like me, do what, uh, let's see, let's make sure I get that right. Be like me, do what I do, say it with me. One, two, three, get to work. <laughs>